as we prepare our own hearts to come to your word, we ask that you would use your word to nourish us, to strengthen us. We remember that your word is breathed out by your spirit through the authors of scripture and that it is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Oh God, our desire is to please you and to honor you in our lives. And so we pray that we would not only be hearers today, but that we would also be doers, that we would hear your word, that it would be rendered unto our hearts by the power of your spirit, and that it would change our lives, that we may grow in Christ's likeness. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to the book of Matthew, which of course is the first book in the New Testament. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 5 today, as we continue in our once a month series. The first Sunday of every month, we are in uh, the the Sermon on the Mount. Um, That way we kind of have one foot in the New Testament, and of course the other weeks of the month, we are in the Old Testament as we're studying the book of 1 Samuel currently. Uh, But today we will be in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. And as we continue in our study on the Sermon on the Mount today, we come to a beatitude that I've got to say is really difficult to understand. And, And when I say that it's difficult to understand, I don't mean that it's difficult to understand in the same sense that all of the beatitudes are kind of difficult to understand uh, as they are entirely contrary. They're, they're entirely uh, antithetical to everything about the natural unconverted man. They're, they're antithetical to every way of the flesh. Uh, so I, so I, I do mean it in that sense, but I mean it beyond that sense. It's also difficult to understand in the sense that this particular beatitude that we come to today contains a Greek word that is sort of difficult to translate. Uh, English simply doesn't have a word that, that matches up, you know, it, you know, equivocally, you know, right, straight across as the majority of, uh, of Greek words do. Uh, the Greek word uh, that we come to in this passage or in this verse that's difficult is the Greek word praus. Prowse. Now, if you've got your Bibles open and you're looking at your Bibles, you'll see that the NASB 95 translation, which of course is the translation that, that I preach from, uh, it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, blessed are the gentle, and prowse is the word that gets translated gentle there. Uh, but I don't think that's a good translation of that Greek word. And, and I don't say that just because, you know, I don't think Christians should be gentle people. No, I, I think we should be. We should absolutely be a gentle people. No question about it. Uh, gentleness is part of the fruit of the Spirit, right? So that, that's not even up for debate. We should be gentle people, but that's not what Jesus is saying here. And the reason I don't think gentle is a good translation starts with the fact that that you can surely uh, bring to mind somebody that you know who wasn't a Christian at all, and yet they were gentle. It it was once deemed virtuous uh, to be a a gentle man, Uh, whether you were a Christian or not. You know, there was an expectation that there's a level of behavior of politeness, if you will, uh, that a a man would exhibit, that it would be gentlemanly. Uh, Andre the Giant, for, for you wrestling fans, Andre the Giant was a professional wrestler who was often referred to as a gentle giant simply because uh, the man was enormous. And if he threw his whole weight into any one move, he'd kill his opponent. And then what would they do the next night, you know, when they went to the next town and did the same thing? So Andre the Giant had to be gentle. And I don't think we want to say that Andre the Giant was exactly what Jesus had in mind here when he says, uh, blessed are the, the, the prows. Uh, we're going to get to that uh, when he said this beatitude. But from the outset of our study uh, on this verse, on this verse in particular, we should remember that as we're going through the Beatitudes, uh, the bar that Jesus sets with the Beatitudes is impossibly high for the unconverted man. 
Uh, the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, means we must be humble before God, not proud, not arrogant, uh, which is the attitude of the flesh, right? The flesh, we've got, we've got an ego. That's what we call it in, in English, right? We've got an ego, uh, but that's the attitude of the flesh of the unconverted man. That's what it demands. It demands that the, the, the man look out for number one first, that, that self comes first, that it's proud, and then in verse 4, the, the comfort that Jesus promises is only to be received by those who mourn for their sin. Uh, these are things that the natural man, the, the, the flesh, will not do. Uh, they're, they're contrary to the unconverted person's nature. And this is simply to say that the manifesto for Christian living that Jesus is laying out before us in the Sermon on the Mount is a type of life that cannot possibly be lived in the flesh. It just can't be. It's, if it's possible for us then to be gentle in the flesh, and I'd say it is, then that cannot be the kind of life that Jesus is referring to, that he's demanding here in verse 5. So what is a better translation of Prowse? Uh, the Legacy Standard Bible, which is probably the Bible that I'll eventually transition to um, in, the, in the coming years at some point, uh, it renders it lowly. Blessed are the lowly. Um, I think that's better. I think that's a little bit closer to the, the meaning of Proust, but at the same time, it's still a little bit too similar to verse 3, uh, which said, blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, the humble, uh, the lowly. The concept of being poor in spirit, of course, you may recall, uh, essentially means being humble. And, and lowly. So, no, if you scan across the way that various translations translate this verse, you'll find that the most common way of rendering this word, rendering this verse by far, is for it to say, blessed are the meek. And that's probably the way you've heard it. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's the translation that we find in the King James Version. That's what we find in the New King James Version, the NIV, the ESV, uh, and, and many others. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, Paul writes this. He says, Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... So what you have to see when you, when you see those two words side by side is that those two things aren't the same thing. And so rendering this verse gentle instead of meek, I think is probably not the best translation. So the question that we're stuck with then is uh, why, why do they translate it gentle or lowly uh, in verse 5 instead of the way that all these other translations translate it, meek? Uh, why do they translate it differently? And I think the answer is pretty simple. Um, it's that most people just have no category in their minds. They have no concept in their minds of what meek is. Uh, it's a badly, badly misunderstood uh, word in our day. Most people just don't use that word in, in everyday speech. It's kind of one of those words that is growing outdated. Uh, in fact, if you look for the word meek in the NASB uh, 95, and you compare that with the King James or the New King James or the NIV, you'll find that the, the NASB almost never includes that word in its translations, whereas other translations use the word meek quite a bit. Uh, and I'm convinced that this is why, because it's a concept, it's a, it's a category that we as a culture uh, have just lost sight of. So what exactly is meekness then? I'm going to start out by trying to help you guys understand what meekness is because there are a lot of misconceptions about what meekness is. I think we can start here by, by recognizing that it's just a quality that is not natural to man. It's a quality that is not natural or inherent to man, like the qualities that Jesus has laid out before us already in the Beatitudes, humility and mourning for sin. The quality of which Jesus speaks here is something that we're not capable of feeling, that we're incapable of demonstrating apart from God's grace working within us, God's Spirit producing it in us. Okay, so while we've established that much, I think it's also worth noting that this is a quality uh, 
that can, and indeed I'd say actually it, it must, it must be found in Christians, in all Christians. It's not optional. None of the qualities, none of the characteristics that Jesus is laying out before us are uh, something that we can say, you know, oh, I'll take it or leave it, right? These things are not optional. These are the family values, the, the values of, of God's family, the, the ethic that those who have been adopted into God's family by his grace are expected to embrace and live by. But it cannot be produced by the flesh. It can't. And so if you're walking in the flesh, you will not be meek. It's as simple as that. It must be produced by God's Spirit working within us to bring this characteristic, this quality about within us. So let me start by, let me start explaining the, the biblical concept of meekness by helping us see what it isn't. Uh, meekness is not laziness. Uh, it, some people mistake laziness or, or indolence for meekness. That's to say they think that meekness is related to uh, idleness uh, or, or inaction, inactivity. Now, that's not what the biblical concept or term means at all. Uh, in Proverbs, of course, we see that laziness or inaction, you know, being a sloth, is something that is frowned upon. It's shown actually to be uh, a characteristic of the foolish. Uh, so that's certainly not what Jesus is praising or, or commending to us here. Uh, it also doesn't mean nice. And that's going to be a controversial statement. Uh, it doesn't mean nice. Now, I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't be nice people. I'd say, yes, we, we should be. I'm just saying that being nice and being meek aren't the same thing. Because again, you can probably think of somebody who's not a Christian who's nice. I can. Uh, we've all probably met people who seem nice, and yet they refuse to submit themselves in faith and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so it doesn't mean nice. It also doesn't mean weakness. Meekness is not weakness. They have absolutely nothing to do with each other, meekness and weakness, in biblical terminology. Uh, Christians should be nice people, yes, but we should also be a courageous people, people who are willing to stand and so willing to stand by our convictions that the world will hate us and revile us in the same way that they hated and reviled our Lord. Because that's when the world really hates us, you know. That's when they hate us. It's when we stand by our convictions. It's when we are unrelenting in our refusal to compromise on our convictions. That's why some Christians are also not hated by the world, because they don't stand by their convictions, because they do compromise. And in fact, they are always eager to compromise, perhaps because they think that being meek means being willing to compromise. Uh, no, that, that, that's weakness. That is not meekness. And it is cowardly, another quality that isn't synonymous with meekness. Being meek does not mean that you're a coward at all. Not only does meekness not mean weakness, but we should also know that meekness is perfectly compatible uh, with strength. And I don't necessarily mean physical strength. Maybe sometimes it, it includes that, involves that. But this is something that even the physically weak can exhibit. Uh, no, I mean strength of character and conviction, strength of character and conviction, a willingness to do things that are not comfortable, a willingness to do things that are not necessarily easy. It can be held by people who are powerful, and it can be held by people who are powerless. I, I would say that meekness has been exhibited by kings who knew the Lord as surely it, as it has been exhibited by defenders of the faith who were being burned at the stake and were powerless to help themselves. Now, thus far, I've only defined meekness for us in a negative sense, but it's important that we define it negatively first uh, so as to remove any false preconceptions that we might have about what it means exactly. So, positively defined. Let's move to that. What is meekness? What exactly does that mean? Martin Lloyd-Jones defined it this way. He said, quote, meekness is essentially a true view of oneself, expressing itself in attitude and conduct with respect to others, end quote. So 
according to Martin Lloyd-Jones' definition, which is a, a pretty good definition, uh, it, there are two aspects of this concept of meekness. First, there's the view that you have of yourself, and then there's the attitude that you have toward others. Uh, I would actually add a third concept to his definition. It also includes your view of and your attitude toward God. Uh, in the words of A.W. Pink, he said, quote, meekness is the opposite of self-will toward God and ill will toward men, end quote. That's a pretty good definition. The opposite of self-will toward God and ill will toward uh, men. Um, as I said a couple lessons ago, the natural man cannot have uh, the kind of humility, the kind of poorness of spirit of which Jesus spoke in verse 3. And this quality, this, this meekness that Jesus speaks of here is much more impossible for the natural man because a man will not be able to be meek in the sense that Jesus means here unless he's first humble, unless he's first poor in spirit. Now consider the ways that this is entirely antithetical, com completely contrary to the natural man's way of thinking. In the mind of the natural man, the man who walks in the flesh and cannot do otherwise, how can he come to possess things of the world? If he were to make a list of 50 things, if he were to make a list of 5,000 things, things, steps to accomplishing his goal. Do you think that being meek or being gentle is going to make it anywhere on that list? I seriously, seriously doubt it. I think if it does, uh, it would say something like, convince people that you are meek, even though you're not. That's the only way that meekness, in the sense in which Jesus speaks, enters the natural man's mind, in the sense of feigning it, faking it, for the sake of deception, for the sake of personal gain. No, as James Montgomery Boyce notes in his commentary, he says, quote, the world associates happiness with worldly possessions, and it believes that the way to gain them is through ability, strength, hard work, self-assurance, and at times even through self-assertion self and conquest, end quote. So think about the cultural context into which Jesus spoke these words. He was speaking to Jews who had been long awaiting a Messiah all along with the expectation that their Messiah would be a, a leader who would have a worldly material kingdom. Uh, they were expecting a Messiah whose legacy would be similar to David's, one of military conquest, military might, conquest, victory over Israel's foes. That's what they were expecting in their Messiah when Jesus said this. What confusion this beatitude would have filled his listeners with if they were able to correctly understand exactly what it was that Jesus was saying must be present in their lives. But let us never be so arrogant as to think that it's not something that also shocks and stuns the modern man just as much and just as painfully because it's unlike anything that we've ever seen, anything we've encountered, anything we've experienced in the world but this is why the world is filled with confusion, why they're, they're unable to make any sense of when Christians have such grace when they are held to the fire, whether that be proverbially held to the fire or literally held to the fire as in burned at the stake. How can Christians have such grace? The answer is meekness. Meekness. Unlike the previous Beatitudes, this Beatitude is actually a quote from the Old Testament Scriptures, if you didn't recognize it. It's actually found in the middle of Psalm 37, following a long list of instructions, uh, all of which are ultimately aimed at encouraging the reader to put their trust entirely in God. So listen to what the psalmist writes, starting with verse 3 of Psalm 37. He writes, uh, and this is David. Uh, he writes, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. <coughs> as the noonday. 
Rest in the Lord. Verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil doing. For evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Oh, hold on to that. Those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land because that's going to be paralleled in just a minute. Verse 10, yet a little while and the wicked man will be no more and you will look carefully for his place and he will not be there. So do you see the point of all these verses? Do you see like the constant instruction, the repetitive instruction? The point here is to rest in the Lord, to wait on the Lord, to trust entirely in the Lord, even in the midst of the most trying circumstances that you've ever experienced or ever will experience. And that all leads to this, which we read in verse 2. Remember, we saw saw the parallel, the first part of the parallel back in verse 9. Those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Verse 11 says this, but the meek will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Now again, the NASB 95 doesn't use the word meek there, but most translations do. So with all of this in mind, what does it mean to be meek? It means to trust in the Lord. It means to rest in the Lord. It means to delight in His ways, to delight in His providence, be confident in His providence and His timing. The meek are those who rest in Him in faith, committing their way unto Him, trusting in the Lord with all of their heart and not leaning on their own understanding. That is what it means to be meek. Maybe the easiest way. We're we're a very visual culture, uh, so maybe the easiest way for us to come to an understanding of what this meekness is that Jesus speaks of is to consider the way that we see it in the lives of characters throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, I think we, we probably see it first in Noah, Uh, The world, of course, was engulfed in a state of perpetual, unrelenting uh, wickedness and rebellion against God, against their creator. But by God's grace, Noah finds favor in God's eyes. And despite the fact that the idea of building an enormous boat, an ark, uh, on land where it seems to have never rained before, at least not up to that point, uh, Noah listens to what God instructs and he endures the ridicule of the world as he constructs an ark far, far away from any body of water. They had to be thinking, what do you think you're doing? Water's never going to come up here. So I'm sure that he endured all kinds of ridicule, which forces us to ask ourselves, how many of you are willing to endure the world's ridicule for the sake of being obedient to God? That's a really important question to wrestle with. How many of you are willing to endure the world's ridicule for the sake of being obedient to God? Because you will be brought to that point. I'll say this, it has become so much more difficult to hold the line against the world. It has become far more costly to follow Jesus than it used to be. These days it could even cost you your job. But how willing are you to post a verse from Scripture that the world might be offended by on your social media pages? How willing are you to offend the world? How willing are you to be ridiculed by the world? Now, Noah, of course, wasn't the only one who endured ridicule. If anybody endured ridicule in the Old Testament, I got to think, what do you think the world did uh, with Ezekiel when he laid on his side, on his left side, for 390 days? Uh, We read this in Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, where God instructs Ezekiel saying, lie down on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel on it. You shall bear their iniquity for the number of days that you lie on it. For I have assigned you a number of days corresponding Responding to the years of their iniquity, 390 days. Thus you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And so Ezekiel laid on his left side for 390 days. And if you thought that was bad, then God continued by saying in verse 6, when you've completed these, you shall lie down a second time. But 
on your right side and bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. I have assigned it to you for 40 days a day for each year. Now, I don't know about you, but I think about how many times I switch sides that I'm sleeping on every night because after like a couple hours on one side, you start to, you know, feel kind of, uh, kind of tight, kind of stiff and uncomfortable. Can you imagine how stiff and uncomfortable he must have been? And this wasn't the only message that God had for Israel that he instructed Ezekiel to act out. He had these ridiculous messages for Ezekiel to give to the world through his actions like that one. But the world around him surely ridiculed him all along for it. So why did Ezekiel go along with it? Because like Noah, he was meek. Think of Abraham. And his demonstrations of of meekness, he had several. One instance in which we see this very clearly was when it became clear that he and Lot needed to kind of go their, their separate ways because the land couldn't sustain both of them. And instead of insisting that he, that Abraham, be the one who chooses which, you know, parcel of land uh, he gets to, to take, which was his right, by the way, because he was the elder of the two and because he's the one that God had led to the promised land. Uh, but instead he allows Lot to choose. And he never uttered a word of discontentment. He never said a single negative thing about it. Never once did he complain. That is meekness. In this way, we might also think of meekness as the opposite of entitlement. Uh, Kids, how many of you guys know what entitlement is. Does anybody, any of you guys know what entitlement is if you're, if you're young? Entitlement is basically thinking uh, that you deserve all the things that you want simply because you want them. That's what it means to be entitled. It, it means you, you could maybe receive this thing, but you haven't done anything to deserve it. You, you haven't earned it. Uh, there's, there's no reason that it should be given to you, but you start thinking, well, I want it, therefore I should have it. That's what's called entitlement. Uh, As you look out at the world right now, you see a lot of that. It's one of the ugliest characteristics about the world right now, just the sense of entitlement that people have these days. Uh, But you need to understand, this is is nothing new. This is is the ego. This is what the ego does. This is what the, the, the proud and the arrogant do. I should get this because I want this. How many wars do you think have been started for that single reason? Uh, again, that, though that is the opposite of meekness. No, people have always had this sense of entitlement. Uh, they're just living now in a culture which actually caters to this sense of entitlement, which causes the sense of entitlement to just completely blow up into the hideous beast that it has become today. Uh, another character who demonstrated meekness in this same sense, in the sense of the opposite of entitlement, is David. Uh, we're not very far off from covering this in our study in First and Second Samuel, but if you know the story of David, uh, you know that David was chosen by God to be Israel's king, and yet King Saul was on the throne. Uh, the throne was rightfully David's, right? God had Uh, had anointed David as the one to sit on the throne, but somebody was sitting there. Saul was sitting there. And yet, David was not eager to take the throne. He had no intention of being the one to dethrone Saul. Instead, he had to endure years of persecution from King Saul, who wanted David dead, knowing that David, he was the one who had the right to the throne. So even when he had the chance, even when David had the chance to take King Saul's life, he refused. Do you see how that is the very opposite of entitlement? It wasn't that David was meek. It wasn't that he was cowardly. It wasn't that he was timid. It was that he trusted God with all of his heart. He leaned on the Lord in all of his ways, walked in his, uh, the Lord's ways in all of his ways. It was that he trusted God's timing with the throne, and he knew that God was the one who was in control of when David would finally sit on the throne. And so he trusted in and waited on the Lord's timing. That is meekness. 
What about Moses? Now, if you know your Bibles, and I hope you do, but if you know your Bibles, you know that the Scriptures are inspired. That word means God breathed, uh, that the Holy Spirit breathed through the human authors who wrote the text, right? You know that. And he did so while keeping the author's personalities and their education and their their vocabulary and all of these things intact. And, And this brings us to something comical. I'll just use that word. It's comical that we read in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Numbers, like the other first five books of the Bible, Numbers was written by Moses, right? Through the inspiration, again, of the Holy Spirit. And when we get to Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, we read this. It says, and keep in mind, Moses wrote this. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And I think the only response we have is to kind of chuckle, to to laugh, because a meek person would never say such a thing about themselves. But again, that only attests to the fact that this was, uh, this has a divine authorship. Uh, But when we zoom out and consider the larger context of that that verse, uh, we realize that this is found right in the middle of a story about uh, racism about a racist rebellion against Moses that was spearheaded by his sister Miriam and his brother Aaron, uh, who was also the high priest of Israel at the time. We read this in Numbers chapter 12, uh, verse 1. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. Now, Moses' first wife had been uh, Zipporah, who was of the same ethnic heritage as the rest of the Israelites. So she looked like the rest of the Israelites. But Zipporah died. And Moses decided to remarry. This time, for his second wife, he marries what we're told is a Cushite woman. Now the Cushites were the inhabitants of ancient Ethiopia. So this woman wasn't a Jew. In fact, she didn't look like a Jew, but that's the point. She had different levels of melanin in her skin. And so then we read in verse 2 of Miriam and Aaron, and they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. See, they're thinking was that Moses, by marrying this woman who didn't look like them, had compromised in a way that rendered him untrustworthy. But God heard what they said. And so what God ends up doing is punishing Miriam by causing her to become a leper. We read this in verse 10, chapter 12 of, of, Numbers, uh, of, of Numbers chapter 12. Verse 10, when the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. As Aaron turned toward Miriam, behold, she was leprous. In other words, God sent the message to Miriam and Aaron that if they thought that being dark-skinned was a bad thing, then her brown skin would be gone. It would just be turned white as snow. In other words, there was nothing wrong with having a different level of melanin. And the message to Israel in that object lesson in that story was that racism would not be tolerated among God's people. And so when all is said and done, Moses heals Miriam of her leprosy. But the point here is that as Moses was maligned, as his character uh, was pulled through the mud, uh, as his, his bride, his new bride was rejected by his own siblings, what did he do to remedy their racism? What did he do about the situation, the animosity that they had toward him, the distrust that they had in him? What did he do? The answer tells us why this is the story in which we read that he was the meekest man on the face of the earth. The answer is that Moses let God handle it. Moses left the situation in God's hands. He trusted in God instead of, you know, trusting in his own understanding, instead of defending his credibility, instead of fighting back on behalf of his wife, instead of leaving with her forever, he left it in God's hands. Now I know, friends, I know that leaving a situation like that 
a situation where you have legitimately been wronged. I know that leaving that in God's hands and not taking action, it, first of all, it's contrary to everything that everybody in the world is doing right now. But I know that it's not easy to do. It's not easy to do at all. We, we want vindication, don't we? If the offense is bad enough, we want vengeance, don't we? We've all been there. We want justice. This past week, um, we went to see the movie Essential Church. Christina and I went to see the movie Essential Church with several of you. And of course, this movie was about the COVID lockdowns and how John MacArthur held the line and refused to comply with the unconstitutional, tyrannical mandates of the state of California. Now, I was sitting in the row right in front of you guys, um, th those of you who were there, and what you probably didn't see that there were, was that there were several scenes uh, in that movie that caused tears to run down my face. And after the movie, we, we stood outside and talked with some of you guys for a while. And uh, as Christina and I were walking back to our car, again, I couldn't even talk. I just got choked up. Uh, why, was this, why was it such an emotional experience for me? It was because I remember the threats of being thrown in jail uh, that we faced. I remember the threat of fines. Uh, I remember worrying that the state would come in and confiscate our church property. I remember some people in our church coming together and saying, we need to establish a legal defense line in our budget because there's a chance, Toby, that you're going to go to jail for this. So you know why I was crying? I was crying because there's part of me that longs for justice. The people who made those mandates, including our own governor, I want to see them brought to justice. But what am I doing to make sure that happens? I'm praying for their salvation. That's it. If anything, I'm just praying for their salvation. I'm trusting that God will handle it. That, that he'll be the one to render justice or grace. And that's his call, not mine. And then that's good enough for me. But believe me when I say that I know how difficult it is to be meek in an era of heightened entitlement and social activism. Moses trusted that God would deal with those who had done wrong to him. He remained humble and lowly before God instead of retaliating and instead of rising up and demanding that God handle them this way or that way. And this cannot, again, this cannot, it will not be done by the natural man. This is a virtue that, that God himself, by his spirit working within us and refining us, only he can produce this quality. That's the only reason that Moses responded the way that he did. And it's in this sense that Moses was actually a foreshadow of the one who was not only the meekest man on the face of the earth in his time, but who was actually meeker than Moses, the meekest man of all time. See, when, when I say that I'm not doing anything, it's not because I'm trying to be like Moses. It's because I, I'm convinced that I need to be like Jesus He's the one who existed in the form of God, yet did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but laid aside his privileges himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. That is the ultimate example of meekness. And what does Paul say to the Philippians? He says, have this mind in yourselves. Be like this. Peter wrote of Jesus saying, he committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That's from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. That, my friends, is meekness. Jesus is the only innocent man who ever uh, who's ever lived, and yet he was put on trial and found guilty of something he didn't do. Blaspheme. Claiming to be God when he wasn't. He could make that claim because he was. My dear friends, in a time in which Christianity is no longer 
culturally acceptable or culturally uh, fashionable. And when, in fact, things like ridicule and, and slander and persecution of Christians is on the rise in our culture, we must learn to imitate Christ in this regard. We must know what it means to be meek, and we must be willing to put it into action, to be more than just hearers, but to be doers. We must be willing to endure hardship, to endure ridicule, hatred, slander, every form of persecution, maybe even losing your job, persevering in our faith in Jesus through it all, trusting in Him to vindicate us. And He will. He will. But think about it. Think of of how contrary meekness is to the spirit of our age Not only are people more entitled, but with the advent of social media, it's a time of of self-promotion like the world has never seen before. People trying to build enormous platforms by saying controversial things. One of the great problems with social media is that being rude and brash with others is actually rewarding. Uh, that's, That's what gets the clicks. That's what gets the likes. That's what gets the retweets. The natural man is is drawn to those. The flesh is drawn to those who are brutish. And every click and every like and every share gives the brutish man a hit of dopamine, which is a very addictive neurotransmitter, enslaving him to the chemicals in his own body that his own body makes in response to signs of peer approval. And there are books on this. That is exactly what happens on social media. You'll find that people say things on social media that they would never say to somebody face to face. Why not? We all know why. It it would result in a physical altercation, right? (laughs) It's true. It's it's kind of funny, but we've seen it. We've, We've all seen it. Anybody who's been on social media has seen it. People say things that they would never say to somebody else's face. There are many in Christian circles who have built enormous platforms for themselves by posting brutish things, by writing brutish blogs. And many of them will justify doing so, saying that, you know, this is what biblical manhood does. So somebody's got to say it. Let me be clear about this. Almost everything that you read on social media or on the internet, on blogs about biblical manhood is written by men who honestly don't know the difference between acting like a man and acting like a meathead. They just don't. They have no idea of what biblical manhood actually is. I've seen many of these same people who are promoting biblical manhood explicitly say that biblical manhood does not require meekness. Really, biblical manhood doesn't require meekness when Jesus is the meekest person and we're growing in his likeness. We're being conformed to his likeness. And biblical manhood doesn't include meekness. Are you kidding? Says who? Not the Bible. That's the world's understanding of manhood. Being dressed up in Christian language for a Christian audience, but it is not biblical manhood. Jesus is the ultimate example of what it means to be a man in a biblical sense. And yet he himself was and is and always will be the purest, quintessential example of what it means to be meek. We're not to be a proud people. We're not to be boisterous, demanding, entitled, or, or a rude people, a brash people. No, we must be meek because we must be like Christ. And we must obey his commands. He is Lord. He is the one who is master. Let us be content to be faithful, lowly, humble, meek servants, a people who rest in him and trust in him alone. Now, I suppose before we close, we should know that like the Beatitudes before this one, there is a second half. There's, there's a reward, a positive consequence, if you will, that comes as a result of having this quality. In this case, it says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What does that mean? 
Well, well, let me start with this. It doesn't mean that America or any other country will become a Christian country. That's not what that promises. Uh, Let's be clear about that much. It also doesn't mean that you're going to be rich, contrary to what the false teachers and false prophets of the prosperity gospel will tell you when they interpret this verse. No, this promise applies to rich and poor people alike, uh, contrary to what those false teachers say. So, so what does this verse mean? What, does, what is this promise, this positive consequence, if we have this characteristic of meekness? Ultimately, it's a promise for the future, for the new heavens and the new earth that will be ushered in at the end of this age. But, but... There is also a sense in which it is applicable right now, today, in in the present as well, because the person who is meek has this right understanding of God and God's sovereignty. When a person has a right understanding of God, they'll also have a right understanding of self. And when one has a right understanding of self, they can be content whatever their circumstances may be. If you have a right view of yourself before God, you know that he owes you absolutely nothing. God owes you nothing. If he owes you anything, it would be justice. And justice would, re- would require that you would just be cast into hell immediately. You deserve nothing more than that. But if you have believed on Christ and are thereby a recipient of his mercy and grace, he has promised that he won't give you what you deserve. He won't cast you into hell forever. Instead of pouring his wrath out on you, Ephesians tells us he lavished his grace upon you. Instead of hating you, he loves you. Instead of leaving you as an orphan, he has adopted you into his family. All of this changes your perspective of of everything. But when you know who God is, when you know that he is a gracious father who always and only gives his children the best gifts, the good gifts that they most need, you start to see that everything that you have has been given to you by God. And thus you're able to find great peace and great great contentment in any and every circumstance. If you are in Christ, if you are resting in him, believing that his work is sufficient, his obedience is sufficient for your salvation, if you are believing in him, if you are trusting in him, then in the words of Jeremiah Burroughs, let your heart be quiet and submit to God in the condition in which he has set you. End quote. If you can do that, and you can, that's what meekness does. And if you're in Christ, the Spirit is working meekness in you. So if you can do this, then, then you can say with the Apostle Paul, who writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 21 to 23, So then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. That's the present application. But know this, if you are in Christ, you may, in fact, in our day and age, you will face ridicule, scorn, reviling, persecution, and hardship in the present. But the scriptures make this promise. If we endure, we will also reign with him. 2 Timothy 2.12. That's future tense. That's the future application of this. Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. And when he does, by his grace, may we be found to be meek. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that your word instructs us, for the way that it corrects us, sometimes for the way it even rebukes us. The way that it's so contrary to the flesh, so contrary to our understanding and our our instincts. Oh Lord, we 
recognize that we can only have this quality, this characteristic of meekness by your grace. But we pray, O oh Lord, that you would, by your grace, work this quality in our lives, produce this quality in our lives. Not only that we may be content in every circumstance, but in order that Christ may be glorified in our lives. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to trust in him, to rest in him, to believe on him savingly. Again, that he may be glorified, but also in order that we may grow in his likeness, including in this quality. God, we pray that it would be a quality seen in us by the world, that it would confuse and confound the world around us, but ultimately, Lord, that Christ would be glorified by this quality being seen in us, produced in us by the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.